Uh, my name is Eric Strauss. I'm coming to you from NYU Langone Orthopedics. I want to start off by thanking everyone here at Arthrex for putting on this great meeting uh, and inviting me back to talk about meniscus allograft transplantation. It's a topic I really enjoy. All right, so we know that meniscus tears uh, continue to be the most common knee pathology that we see and treat. And compared to the 60s and 70s when open total or subtotal meniscectomy was the standard of care, an improvement in our understanding of the importance of the meniscus to normal knee kinematics has really focused us on repairing menisci whenever possible, as we just heard, or minimizing partial meniscectomies when necessary. However, we are often faced with a tear that, despite our best efforts, leads to significant tissue excision. And we know, as we just heard, that this is a big deal because it significantly increases the contact stresses seen within the affected compartment. So we're often faced with a clinical dilemma. We have a young, active patient who comes in with activity-related pain and swelling following a significant meniscectomy. We know from their index procedure arthroscopic photos that the articular cartilage in the affected compartment is intact, and we also know that there's a poor natural history in the meniscectomized knee. So it leads us to ask, well, what are our treatment options? So while we can definitely unload the affected compartment with an osteotomy, any arthroplasty of any kind is really not ideal in this young active patient population. So it brings us to the role or the potential role that a meniscus allograft transplantation plays in this patient population. So the rationale for meniscus transplantation started popping up in the mid-1990s when studies like this uh, published in the Journal of Knee Surgery uh, showed that you can restore more normal contact pressures and kinematics in the setting of a bridge and slot meniscus transplantation compared to the meniscectomized state. This, coupled with animal studies that show that a meniscus allograft can reliably incorporate peripherally, led to increased interest in this uh, technique for the symptomatic meniscal insufficient patient. So here's kind of the, uh, the laundry list of indications uh, when we're thinking about patient selection for meniscus transplantation. So the patient should be relatively young, uh, basically less than age 50, who comes in with affected compartment pain uh, following a uh, significant meniscectomy. Comorbidities such as cruciate insufficiency or malalignment need to be identified uh, as part of the workup and treated either concomitantly with or in stage fashion uh, with respect to the meniscus transplantation. So basically every single patient uh, who we're considering a transplant on is going to get a set of long leg alignment films in the office. Ideally, the patient has intact cartilage in that affected compartment with no more than a small area of focal grade 3 uh, changes present. So with respect to surgical technique, uh, for every one of my lateral meniscus transplantations and a few of my isolated medial meniscus transplantation, I prefer the bridge, the bone bridge technique. And the benefit of this approach is that it basically maintains an, uh, the anatomic relationship between the anterior and posterior horns. On the left, you're going to see our final product. So there's our allograft in place with our uh, vertical mattress inside out sutures. And on the right is a second look. Uh, we had to basically operate on the, uh, the other meniscus, and you can see that it incorporated very well peripherally, uh, and there's our osteochondral allograft, which also looks fairly good. So for more and more of our medial meniscus transplantations, especially those with a concomitant ACL reconstruction, I, I prefer to do a double bone plug technique, as you see here. So you can see on the bottom left uh, how we prepare the allograft meniscus with two small bone plugs that are typically 7 millimeters in diameter. Uh, we're going to start by preparing our posterior tunnel, which is very similar to what we saw with preparing a, uh, for a posterior root repair. So we're going to use the Arthrex Tibial ACL drill guide. We're going to drill a blind tunnel with a flip cutter, pass our posterior plug, then create our anterior tunnel through a small arthrotomy, fix the posterior aspect with a cortical button distally, and our anterior plug with a swivel lock. So here you're going to see a short video just highlighting that technique. So as you see here, we're uh, localizing our uh, posterior root uh, tunnel. It's typically an 8 millimeter diameter flip cutter uh, drilled to a depth of 15 millimeters. So we pass our shuttling sutures, as you see here, that allows us to dock our posterior bone plug. Once it's uh, basically uh, seated in that tunnel, we're going to proceed posterior to anterior, performing our meniscal repair. So we're using zone-specific cannulas with uh, vertical mattress sutures, uh, both on the superior and inferior aspects of our meniscal allograft. And you can see what that does is it gives you a nice balance for repair with the allograft sitting nicely within the affected compartment. So over the last few years, there have been an increasing number of studies published on meniscal allograft transplantation. 
And as you see from this table, most are relatively small with respect to patient numbers. There's also a large variability with respect to the result re results reported. But the more recent studies that implore, employ uh, appropriate uh, graph preparation and technique have shown better outcomes. So in 2011, Elatar uh, put together a meta-analysis of 44 trials that included more than 1,000 uh, patients who had undergone meniscus allograft transplantation. And they found significant improvements with respect to the VAS and Lysholm scores uh, postoperatively, leading them to conclude that meniscal allograft transplantation can be considered safe and reliable for the treatment of refractory post menisectomy symptoms in selected patients. So what about returning to athletics after a meniscus allograft? It's something that always comes up when we talk about this topic. So Cole and the guys at Rush had a series of 13 patients ranging from high school athletes to professionals and found that a little more than three years, more than three quarters of their patients had returned to their desired level of play. So just to give you two quick success stories. So the first is a 28-year-old male who came in with right knee pain and swelling. He'd undergone a right ACL reconstruction with an Achilles allograft and a subtotal medial meniscectomy five years prior to an outside hospital. He came in with pain and swelling with activities coupled with intermittent mechanical symptoms. And these symptoms were limiting his ability to exercise. So here's his imaging, hopefully you can make it out. You can see evidence of the ACL reconstruction and the significant medial meniscectomy. His long leg alignment films show a normal mechanical axis. So here on the left you see what we, what we encountered at the time of the diagnostic arthroscopy and there's the meniscal allograft that had been implanted with using a double bone plug technique. So unfortunately, he ends up re-tearing his ACL, which gives us an opportunity to take a look at the meniscus two and a half years later. And I think you'd agree, unless you knew it was an allograft, you'd be surprised, because it really does look like his native meniscal tissue. So now he uh, is 10 months, at 10 months post-op, he ends up climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, sends me this picture, he denies any pain, swelling, or mechanical symptoms. He's about as happy a patient as I have. So our next case is a 19-year-old right-hand dominant male collegiate pitcher who came in present complaining of left knee pain, swelling, and mechanical symptoms. Back in 2007, he had a bucket handle lateral meniscus tear that was treated with a subtotal partial lateral meniscectomy. He had done well until three weeks pr uh, prior to his presentation. When his knee twisted on follow-through, he felt a pop and his knee locked. He had been un unable to bear weight and came with a very large effusion. So there on his plain films, you could see the large osteochondral lesion of his lateral femoral condyle and his alignment film showing a normally aligned uh, left lower extremity. So at the time of the initial scope, he's got this large uh, osteochondral lesion of his lateral femoral condyle and significant lateral uh, meniscus insufficiency. So he un ended up undergoing a lateral meniscus transplant with a concomitant osteochondral allograft. Uh, the lateral meniscus was done with a bridge and slot technique, and we uh, got video of him pitching. Uh, he ended up going back to baseball at a year, it's not perfect, he has some post-game soreness, but no swelling or mechanical symptoms. And at the end of last season, he pitched the uh, best he'd pitched in a long time uh, with four wins and a good ERA. So my series at, at, back at NYU is, has been successes, but definitely not all roses. So I'm just short of about 70 patients, uh, basically almost an even split between male and female with a mean age of a little more than 26 years. Uh, a little more lateral meniscal transplantation performed than medial, and as you can see, 25 of the patients had undergone concomitant procedures ranging from ACL reconstructions to osteotomies and cartilage procedures. 52 of the patients have more than a year of follow-up uh, with a mean of uh, just about 30 months. As you can see, we're doing fairly well with respect to our mean VAS and Lysholm compared to our pre-op baseline. But there's no pretending there have been failures and the failures haven't been pretty. We have two patients that ended up going on to total knee arthroplasty at very young ages a 34-year-old and a 35-year-old. Four ended up had to, had to go back and trim and perform a partial meniscectomy on the allograft, and one underwent a revision. So to kind of pull it all together, symptomatic meniscal insufficiency in a young patient could be a common scenario and no doubt a difficult problem to address. We know that left alone has a poor natural history. So what I hopefully got across to you is that for the appropriately indicated patient, a meniscus allograft transplantation can relieve pain and improve function likely due to its uh, restoration of more normal load distribution. Whether or not it slows the development or progression of osteoarthritis is yet to be proven, uh, but it's something that you want to keep in your armamentarium when dealing with these patients. Back home, I've definitely tasted successes, but also some failures, but I think it's promising enough a technique that we're all going to be doing it in a, with greater frequency moving forward. So I appreciate your time, and once again, for Arthrex for having us down here.